He said, this is nuts. It's kind of... You're used to bigger audiences than this. Nah, but it's, this is different now, isn't it? Intimate. Yeah, man. It's, it's really... <laughs> What's that? <laughs> <laughs> it's good, though. It's good. All good. Right, thanks for coming as well, man. Because just show me that people give a shit. I'm going to try and answer all your questions. Uh. Of course, man. Real You're life, a national li- treasure, bro. Live Twitter thing, like, innit? I hear you. I hear you. All right, bro. So, um... Obviously, you're very, you're incredibly talented. Everyone knows that, right? Um, so you smile there. Good, 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 good. Um, but I want to take it back to back in the day. Before we talk about the Boy in the Corner album, um, I want to take it to back in the day, and I want to know where you first discovered how talented you was. What was your first intro to music and you discovering exactly how talented you was? Probably DJing. Okay. Drum and bass records. I used yeah. to, um, anyone knows DJ Target, I used to buy records off him because he lived down the road on my estate. So I used to buy records from him, um, just trying to mix. I was just trying to, I wanted to be a big jungle DJ, but I was like 14, 14, 15. Yeah. So it, it didn't really kick off. And then, um, you know, you got the bedroom set up, just MCing, sorry, having the DJs, sorry, having the MCs around the setup. And then I'll jump on the mic sometimes just because, but really I was just, uh, a DJ, and then from there I was doing pirate radio, I was DJ, and then I started MCing properly, and then in school I started, that's when I started making beats, so it was somewhere around then. So what was you using to make beats? Cubase, anyone know what Cubase? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So right. them school ones. You know, but I remember Playsta- um, Music 2000 on PlayStation, anyone remember that? Okay. So that, that, was the, that was like the first Fruity Loops or whatever kind of thing, and you could just put the shit together, it sound good. Okay, okay. So I remember the first time hearing you like on pirate radio. I, I, want, I want you to take us back to like pirate radio and how important that was for you and how, how it felt to be on pirate radio. How influential was that in you becoming Dizzy Rascal? That, that was everything to me because that's, at one point, that's all, that, that, that's all I wanted because you had things like Deja Vu, Rinse FM, and I was lucky, they, they were all kind of local, I could, that's, like, that was around me. So I used to listen to the sets, I used to listen to Carnage, Genius, all, all, like, all the, the, the jungle DJs and that, and I, was, I used to ring up live call-ins and all that, I remember that. And I just wanted to just DJ so bad. Um, but when I finally got on there, I remember, what, what was the set? There was, one, there was one little radio station that someone started up around uh, near Bow Church. Okay. And a couple of my brethren who were um, just in my local area, we went up there, we used to do a set. And then eventually I got on, I did a graveyard uh, shift on Rinse FM for like one till three in the morning and then went to school. This was when I was like um, 15 or whatever. <laughs> but but that, that's how much it meant to me to see, even just be on the station. Like, I just know that like, Genius didn't really like me then. That's when I was a bit of a little shit. Like, he, he used to see me on the estate. But I, man, I managed to get on there, like I said, just as a DJ. And then when I fully really wanted to get into MCing, it really started with the youth clubs, because that's, that's, you'd have to set up there and you'd MC in front of everyone. But then eventually I went on Flavor FM. That's where I know Kano and all them from, like, from, from that's it, from young. And then um, Ritz FM, Deja Vu. Heat FM was the one that I was on strong though. That was in North London, over in Tottenham. So I used to go over there with Rough Squad and all that. Um, just bump into all sorts of people down there, but that's the one that they, they gave me a proper shot. Heat FM and Flavor FM, Rinse FM, kind of, and Deja kind of came later, but that's when I started really becoming like Dizzy Rascal when people started knowing who I was and that. So Dizzy Rascal, I mean, that's the name that really stood out, and I think a lot of people, even before they heard you spit or heard any of your music, were like taken aback by that name. Like, where did you get the name Dizzy Rascal? I was called Dizzy. I don't know why. I just did it. I just, I just, I like Dizzy. I don't know why. I just said Dizzy, and then there was another dude called Dizzy. You reminded me of it. This twin over there. You remind, your brother reminded me. There was another dude called Dizzy. This, like I said, was when I was a DJ, and we had to clash for the name. And you, I remember it was from Pop Life. It was a big deal. I won though. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. And I kept the name. So then I was Dizzy, mm. and then um, must have been when I started my first secondary school. It's called Blessed John Roach in Pop Life. So I was year seven, and I remember teachers said, oh, you're such a rascal. He said something like that. So then I changed my name to Rascal, and then obviously people were still calling me Dizzy. So I just put the two together, and kind of that was it. Okay, okay. So um, coming from East London, the birthplace of grime, 
Um, did you enjoy the, the competitiveness at that time in pirate radio? Is that something that you look back on and you, you miss? Um, do you like that side of Grant? We're talking like early, early. It was something that took us to other areas. Like say, everything was segregated. It's like if you're from Bow, you were from Bow. If you were from Hackney, you were from Hackney. If you were from Plasto, you were from Plasto. All, all, all those things, like all the different boroughs and that. But I might be in it. I might go to a youth club because they had a they had a setup, and we were known. I said that's where I know people like Kano and all that, or or Getz. Like Getz was Reggie back then. These the early early. This is before me and Roll Deep before all of that. Like. So we go there, or I might be in a youth club in Deptford, and that's where I know whatever big nasty from his younger cousin. And like I said, this is when I'm like young. So it, it, it there was a competitiveness then, but it was almost like for me it was a necessity. I just wanted to just do this so bad, uh, but it, it was cool, it was fun. I'm, I'm glad that I know all these people. There's so much people that I might not be like associated publicly with, because I kind of keep a low profile now, but I know I'm cool with so many people. There's so many MCs, so, so many of your favorite MCs that I came up with like way before I was on telly, way before all of that. So that that's that's what that's that's what's good about it. That's what come out of it. We all come from grassroots, you know what I mean? So. Okay, so um. The Boy in the Corner album, obviously, no one had heard anything that sounded like that. Mm. Still to this day, I think that's, you know, proper unique sound, man. Um, what music was you listening to at that time that influenced you to make an album of that sound? Drum and bass, always. Like that, that, that's my roots. When people talk about my roots, that's my root, jungle. Um, who, from the, who from the jungle world really Kind of trend and target, trend and target again because they were local. But when they had tunes like Two Degrees and Tune Your Bass and all these tunes, and other shy effects, anyone who I guess anyone who was big in drum and bass at the time, whether it was DJ Hype or fucking, as well as people like Twisted Individual, Dylan Jar, or just all, all that shit, all, that whole era between '95 and '99, or something like that. And then Garage came along. I was listening to Garage. I started DJ in Garage, but I didn't have the money to keep up with the record buying because. What really happened was drum and bass kind of uh, was kind of dying out. It was it weren't in the forefront as much. Garage came to the forefront, so then I had old jungle records. I weren't keeping up to date because Target gave me all his records when he quit. <laughs> but then buying new records that cost that cost money, and I didn't keep up with it. I think that's when I was starting really emceeing more as well and kind of letting go on the DJ side of things. And what else? I was even before all that. I was into grunge. Like I loved. Nirvana, I love whatever, Guns N' Roses, nice hard rock, um, Metallica, Iron Maiden, Korn. Wow. I was into all that shit there. And um, and then you have to think about what we were spitting to on the radio as well. This is when um, like Garage kind of got a bit darker. So when Wookiee started coming in with them, them bass lines and um, Narrows, like early, early dubstep, when dubstep was sublo. So even though I was making my beats around that time, them guys were still already established. Whatever Slimzy was playing mm. on, on those sets when like when Vince was in <laughs> Dagnum and the music was a bit weird, no one really knew what to call it, but it's pre grime pre-dubstep, pre all of that. So obviously I was into that. Okay. Um, a lot of people obviously looking forward to the... And R&B. R&B, yeah? Yeah, yeah? yeah, definitely. Big, big. For the ladies. Of course. Okay. Yeah, it, it was the tempo as well. So that, that had an influence. The, the, the smoothness, the way the, sh the shit used to interlock and all that. But in terms of being smooth for the ladies, you wasn't quite smooth for the ladies on Boy in the Corner. What, what was you going through? <laughs> do you know, that, do you want to know the truth, man? Yeah, you, know, yeah. you know what it was, yeah? If anyone, I'm not like a proper classically trained musician. I couldn't like sit there and read like music. If you put it in front of me, I still couldn't to this day. But I used to do my kind of rendition of the stuff I liked, whether it was, so like I Love You and some of that stuff on, um, Boy in the Corner was like crunk. Crunk is just what trap was back then. So whatever trap is today, that's what Little John and whoever and Three Six Mafia were doing back then. But when it came to the R&B, I definitely couldn't do it. So that's where Jezebel and them come from. Not from the content, yeah. but as the fact that um, who's heard that song, uh, Foxy Brown? Um, Ooh, baby, gotta get you home with me tonight. I wrote Jezebel to that. So that's so, but I'm not an R&B guy, so I couldn't do them sweet melody, them sweet chords. You know what I mean? So that's what ended up coming out. 
excused, obviously, the, the content of what I was saying, obviously, as well. But that's, that's, the, that's the closest I could... And I Love You remix, that's, like, the closest I could get to it. So you clearly... You wasn't kind of in love with anyone at that time. I might have been. Oh, re time. really? You know, the girlfriend, like, but I, I, was, I was about, but you know, you've got that little one. Just what, 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 what? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I was about, yeah. Um, where, where was you mentally when you wrote boy in the corner like if you could describe your life at that time and where you was mentally happy sad angry a bit scared of, a bit of all of that a bit of all because this is when i was just like i was just just i dropped out of college that's the reason i dropped out of college to because I, I went to redbridge college for like um nine months and the mistake i made was i went college with loads of people i didn't go to school with so it became like a bit of a joke like it weren't it weren't serious. So eventually, I, one day I was sitting in in the, um, in class making these beats. But the, the, these times I'd already been known with like Nasty Crew. Anyone knows a Nasty Crew is like. So I was known in my college already. This is where who, who went to my college? You see, um, what's Gigs is Gigs is um, Gigs Buck. Yeah, yeah. You see, but I went to college with Buck, and it was my college. So these these times I was known already in there so it's like oh what's the point so i just dropped out but um aside from that th i didn't have nothing else going on other than being in the studio so these times i was still in the studio with cage and wiley and all that but outside of the studio was just badness it was just like it was just a lot going on so just through seeing loads of shit that i really shouldn't have been seeing i guess through having too much time on my hands and being around people that had too much time on their hands or, and were doing shit that they shouldn't have been doing either, I just, it affected me. So that's where a lot, a lot of that stuff came from. Was there a lot of pressure? Because I think everyone was looking at you at that time as like, um, you know, the, the, the spearhead of grime. I didn't know that. Nah, really? I just, I, like I, said, I was just so into what I do. Like I said earlier, it was such a competitive thing. Like, it just, like I said, this was a thing that let, let me be in the middle of fucking a, a, of a dance surrounded by ha surrounded by Brixton and Peckham Mutes. And like I said, I know everything's all Gram 2.0 now and everything's all mixed and gentrified or whatever you want to call it. But back then, yeah, that meant something, innit? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> for real though. Got my point now. You love me. <laughs> just, just if you felt the pressure, did you feel the pressure from no, the no, outside? No, no, no. I just that's what I mean. I just loved it so much that I did. I just I, you, I didn't need no pressure to be this like you, you doing it for the scene and doing it. It wasn't like that. It was just we we just I need to make a song for the dance. Like Rumble Stampede's coming up. I need I need a banger for that or whatever. And then eventually. <laughs> You know, who knows Rumble Stampede? Oh. Yeah, see, you'd to, yeah, yeah. And then eventually, later on, you had things like Fix Up Look Sharp, which was a dub plate for Westwood because I wanted to get played on the rap show because I still saw myself as a rapper. Mm. But again, I wasn't able to make the, the rap of the day. What was that? Like Dipset or who would have been big around those times, innit? So I didn't, have, like, I didn't have access to that type of music anyway. So all this is, so Cage made that one. He was just playing a record. I heard it. Ah, God, oh, what's that? Yeah, wait, like, put that there, put that there. And then I wrote the lyrics to it and all that. So it, everything on that album kind of had this, there was a reason for it, but it wasn't because of, like, it's time to spearhead grime, this is our time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. Like, <laughs> it weren't like that. It, it's, it's like that now, isn't it? Like, because it all worked. Like, this was just a pure, honest thing. It was a real scene. It, it was just, it's just love. That's it. All right, we'll, we'll get back to the genre grime in a sec, but Fix Up Look Sharp. Mm. Would you say that was a massive turning point for you, that record? In, in any way, because I just felt, when I saw kind of like people... Do you want to know yeah. God and His Truth? I don't want to fuck, like, disappoint no one. The video See, is that whole, crazy. That whole album, that, especially the whole early days, I don't know what the fuck was really happening, bruv. Like, I was just in it. Like, just in it. Then I got stabbed in Napa. Then my mind was in a total different place because I lived in a council estate. I was running around doing whatever, as well as making music, just acting up, just a, just a mad you. And then I've been thrown into the fame. So it, it just became a case of just trying to, okay, just, just stay in the studio, do your shows or do what you need to do and just keep it moving. I can't keep up. I didn't really like know or understand what, what 
what was going on outside. Even though this is still mad to me, like you don't get used to it. Like I'm sitting in a room with you lot talking about some shit I did 13 years ago, like, <laughs> and I can't remember everything that happened. Like. <laughs> well, do your best, please. Do your right, best. Right, yeah, exactly, right. <laughs> um, okay, can I take you back to the uh, the awards that you've won? So right, I'm right. Ivan Novello, Mercury, Brit. Yeah. You got a mobo. I've got a few. They didn't send me them though. You, you got a few mobo. <laughs> Um, I, I just remember kind of like seeing you with a baggy T-shirt on, picture of yourself. Uh, yeah. Trying to sell but that merch, who's, who's idea was that? I think it was You're probably my idea. Okay, all right. <laughs> clever, clever. Yeah, yeah. Holding the award to the camera, and then I remember kind of this is the Mercury Award, right? Yeah. And then I remember, uh, I think, I think it was the Mercury Award. Just seeing you back on your council estate, yeah. And your friends holding the award. And you looking quite nonchalant about it. You're just in the background, like you don't really give a, a shit. I didn't know what it was supposed to be. No, you yeah, have to yeah, understand. Yeah. Like I said, all like who watched the Mercury Awards in the hood? Come on, bruv. Like yeah, for yeah. real. Back then, it weren't until Dynamite won it. Like oh, Miss Dynamite's won an award. Oh, wicked. Like, what's that? Like, we knew what the Mobos was, obviously. We know what the Brit Awards was because Brit's the biggest thing in it. But the Mercury Awards, that's like a cool industry music thing. So th that. If you if you go back and watch the video, I was miffed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah they they're coming. Watch out, yeah. Like, cause I was supposed to do a speech then. I don't know what, know what the speech is. I don't know. I'm here. I've won this thing. Cool. And then I went home to the estate and passed it around and was confused. <laughs> Basically, that's that's the truth in it. <laughs> like, and then the next morning, like I said, my first real like taste of fame, like proper fame, like. Press like paparazzi. Look at him. He's got his camera there right now. Just stop speaking. Look at him. He's just snitching. <laughs> like paparazzi. Like downstairs. Like we're not leaving until we get an uh, interview. What do you mean you're not leaving until you get an interview? You, like you need to move, innit? What do you mean? <laughs> no. Like not understanding that. Nah, you, there's nothing you can do about it. Like it has to just. You have to go down and do it. Daniel Shitu, footballer. He's. He sorted that for me. He's the one who eased it up and made me go down there because I'm out there. In fact, he was a big influence on me early before everyone you've ever heard of was an influence on me. But he he smooth. That's when I, that's when I learned. Is he still playing? Well, he used to I play for so. Watford. Oh, he played for a few, played yeah. for Millwall, played for a bag of teams, yeah. QPR and all that. But um, yeah, so that 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 was my that's the, so it, the whole thing was just weird. Eventually, I did it. They went away, but it, it it was just mad to throw someone into that situation. You know what I mean, and I was young, so it was crazy. So how long, I mean, a lot of this attention what is because of Boy in the Corner. Right. You know, it's, it's incredible. But how, how long did it take you to make that album? Are you one of those MCs that kind of takes you days to make a track? Or do you go in there and just kind of like, no, no piece of paper, just spill it off top and all that? How, how's, what's the working process like for you in the studio? Those times, it was... Um I just went in there and I had fun. I just had so many ideas. So, like Cage would have a load of samples and a load of things up in the com on the computer. And for me, this was like, fucking hell. Like, it's all at my disposal. So I, he'd lay all the samples out across the keyboard. So yeah, I like that sound. I like that, I like that. And then I'll just play it. So like, I love you. Push. Just keep going. And like there's the times I was so excited, I'd play the whole thing all the way through. So <laughs> that that's how it was then. But as far as the process, I, I don't know, man. Different days in, I'll just go and try different things. I remember going to Sheffield at one point. We fin kind of finished the album there. But as far as the process, I'd like honestly, I don't, I, I don't think I even really thought about the process until maybe the third album. I was, I was just, just doing it in the first album, just doing it, and then it kind of, I got a record deal off the back of what kind of, what I've done. And then it's the third album, once you've had a few albums out, and you know that, right, I make albums. I'm going to be on the TV, I'm going to be on the radio, they're going to promote me, it's time to make an album. And then you start thinking, and that's when I started experimenting more, so then like, I don't know, something like Sirens. I, I, I'd never really played live instruments, I like, get out the drum kit. I'm not an amazing drummer, but let me try a little thing there. I definitely can't play the guitar, but give me the guitar. <laughs> Fuck around with this thing here quickly. Tweak it, do some shit to it. And then got the thing rolling. And then, ah, you know what? You know what would be wicked? If we put um, corn, like I said, I was into corn. I said, ah, here to stay. Does anyone know that song, here to stay? 
So I was like, yeah, I like, I like that. So, let's, so for the shows, I'm going to do this and then put corn at the end of it so that everyone moshes. And then that's we got in, when we got into, okay, we can get that thing that you like replayed. So if you hear the end of um, Sirens, that, that is just basically here to stay being replayed. But that's, a, that's the kind of thought process I was in by, by the third album. I was just, just, in the first album, I was just doing it. And then obviously the raves and the whole one, the pirate scene, that had a big influence in it. That, that started to have less of an influence as I started going on. So it, it is a grime album though, right? It, it wasn't, at the time, all that st Wiley co-signed all that, that, all that grime shit and all that esky shit. Because basically I was doing that before him. Wiley was making like Wickedest Thing and before that Nicole's Groove and all those garage tunes. That was his take on like vocal so you, garage. You being in the thick of it, when's the first time you heard the label grime? Like I was in Mile End and someone said, oh yeah, yeah, you lot are making that grime, innit? I said, what, the f what, what, you, what, what do you mean? Like, <laughs> I didn't just see it as that, but I was making what I was making in like 2001. From like I said, from after school, I've got tracks called what was that track called Boy Dem about a track called Crime, uh, Crime. Yeah, yeah Cage has got to send me that. He promised to send me that. So. Yeah, those early ones where I was sampling Three Six Mafia records, but I was at the first thing where I was doing the grimy bass lines and all that shit there. But the grime, like I said, Wiley, he he put he put the esky thing on it to kind of claim it, like okay, no, because he didn't. No, I'm not going to be quite. This is esky. This is my thing. But it's all in the same. Genre you know thing, but I never really saw myself as like, ah, I am grime. This is grime. We are grime. We do grime. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I just, I just experimented with stuff. And even at the time, the way people talk about wearing the corner, it's corner. But at the time, there's a lot of people that didn't get it and thought, ah, what the fuck is this? This is car crash music. Yeah, you have to think about what else was out around the time. Like as far as hip hop, it was all Dipset. There was all, all, all sorts of stuff that where my shit just sounded odd. So where, where was the pushback from? Was there pushback from like mainstream radio or was there pushback from like pirate radio once you dropped Boy in the Corner or was everyone just really receptive to it? Bruv, like, I, I don't know, bruv. Like, if I, like I said, it's just all different sets of people had different shit to say about it. The hood had one thing to say about it. The fucking whatever, the hipsters, the cool people, the, the tastemakers, they had one thing to say about it. Whatever, I just kind of just got on with it. I had other things on my mind, man. You know, um, kind of, when you make a classic album, right. uh, some artists kind of suffer from it, you know, because, you know, fans and everyone says, I want a part two, you know, Jay-Z, whatever, whoever suffers from that. Have you felt yourself suffering from it? And what, what would you say to the people that it's say to you? pain in the I'm fucking ass, brother. <laughs> like, go make Boy in the Corner 2. Fucking leave me alone, brother. Like, I was like 17. What the fuck's the matter with you? Boy in the Corner but 2, yeah. Bro. to be fair, this all started happening with social media. I didn't have that pressure in 2004, 2005, because there weren't no way of telling me that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be real, innit? Like, yeah. all this has come about. I'm thankful, it's got its double edged it's like, the good part of it is that I'm sitting here with you lot now, because social media's brought it, it's brought it back up to my attention, because I'm an artist, I'm just trying to make the next thing, the next thing, okay, what excites me? Okay, let me try and make that. But this album is just, I guess it's like what Nas's Illmatic would be, to be honest. so I understand it and I get it. But um, nah, there wasn't that pressure back then. I just rolled straight into my second album, just straight away, because I just made that decision that I could go one or two two ways, innit? It could just go really bad, or I can just get on with it. But luckily, I was I was the young kid around Pay As You Go and More Fire and whatever, Maxwell and the Soul. So I got to see where some people went wrong. I got to see the real dark side of it. like. I got to see whatever, the extortion attempts, the kidnappings, the, the whatever, all the other extra shit like that no one don't talk about today. Like I saw it all as a kid. I saw people's friends turn on them. I saw all sorts of shit. So I just, I was luckily, I, I, I learned to move a bit different then. I'm, I'm glad there was no social media then as well because the, the draw outs were less. The draw outs were just like, I said, if you was out on the street and someone decided he wanted to problem, it was just on just there and then. There weren't 500 people telling, yeah, you're a prick, just online. <laughs> Like, just, just because, like, and then DMing you, what I want though? Like, so it was easier back then. Is that, is, is that one of the hardest things about being Dizzy Rascal, or was one of the hardest things, is kind of moving through that? Yeah, try, trying to manoeuvre between Beef. being fucking a, just a boy from wherever, regular council estate, working class area in whatever, London, to being thrown 
into fame or being thrown on the telly and then maneuvering through the industry and already, already maneuvering through the rave scene where was one thing. There's all sorts of characters in there. Got everyone from wherever, dodgy promoters to gangsters to, to, to whatever, all sorts of people that you have to try and tread the line. And, and then whatever, your other friends, your, some of your friends are still doing whatever that they're doing and they're not understanding why they're not following you to every show, why they can't be around, why they can't do this, why they can't that. And then people turn on you and you have to deal with that. This guy today thinks he wants to do me something. I can't let him do me something. But these people think I'm a role model. So what are you doing? Okay, so then uh, can I just make music then? And just, just I have to just try and mind my own business. It's, it's mad. It's not so much now though. So um, you know what? Um, you're influenced clearly by Free Six Mafia, Luda. Mm. You always, what is it about like Free Six Mafia, Bun B? Because I, d I don't feel a lot of people in the UK often use them as reference points, because as their heroes. Because they don't know. They don't know that Free Six Mafia started all this crunk shit that they eventually became trap. They, they, they think Atlanta is where all that shit come from and it's kind of come from Memphis. But I was into that then. So when I was making Boy in the Corner, I was listening to ass, titties, ass and titties, <laughs> ass. And then what well, they got it from DJ Assault from Detroit anyway, that was just a remake, but that whole crunk sound was just dark. But it was the same tempo as Garage, what was going over here. And so imagine w when Timberland made um, Is That Your Chick? Remember that for Jay Z? Of course. That yeah. So that's where I love you come from. So I've, um, it was a cross between that and What's Your Fantasy, Ludacris. Like the call and response with the girl and all that shit there. So that, that was my take on both of those tracks. But they, when they came out, they were both kind of odd tunes. They were different for the day, innit? But they were the tempo that we was all used to here because of Garage. And then especially the darker side of Garage, like I say, like. Um, what, what, um, uh, what's musical mob when all that kind of stuff, you know what I mean? It started to get a bit bouncy, a bit darker. That was more us. Okay. So um, I was there when you came out with Stormzy at Wireless, which was an amazing moment. It's kind of like the old school, if you don't mind me calling you that. The old school <laughs> and the new school. Right, right. Um, what was that like for you? Because it, obviously it, it that- It was different. That, I don't, hmm. I've never done that before. It was different, because you know, if I'm honest, I, I haven't seen anybody, I, I've, I've worked with every younger or who, who's come out, who they've said, ah, oh, this is the next Dizzy Rascal, over the years, I've always worked with him and that. But I've never seen anybody his level, like as far as that, the, the shows he's commanding, and, and his performing ability. So it felt good to go on there with him, like it's all, oh, it's all professional, it's all for it. And then I was really like, right, he kept the elements, of everything that was going on back in the days, like rah, nah, them nice nah, real. So nah, I mean, that, that felt good. But then that, that was when I saw the, um, again, a, another next generation of, of kids. Like, ah, he's there saying, ah, I was on the roads when Dizzy made Lion of You. Like, they definitely don't know I love you that well. <laughs> and they weren't on the roads. So it's, it's mad, rah, I'm at that stage in my like, like career now. Like, oh shit, like, like I'm getting older than like, like time goes, you're not just gonna stay young forever. Like some people got this image of me of in, in my hoodie, and that's all they're gonna remember and all they're gonna accept. It's like, like I'm in my thirties now, like it's done, innit? Like, <laughs> but that definitely let me know. Okay, okay, yeah, because that, that's interesting because I think um, how do you feel? I think one thing you don't get enough credit for. I think a lot of people might think that like, why is he still so relevant and stuff? Is your live show is. Awesome, and it yeah, always cheeky cunts. What do you mean? All of my <laughs> life, so. that's what I'm saying. This is the problem with social media, the cheeky <laughs> bastards, bruv. Because for 13 years, few. okay, everyone's all gassed up now with the 2.0. But yeah, what yeah. the fuck do you think I've been doing for 13 years? Like, you think I've just been there waiting? It's coming, yeah. like, <laughs> no, what are you talking about? All right, been well, around the world, bruv, doing this. Fuck them, middle finger up to them, yeah, but um, so you've made me forget my question now. Uh, so how well do you think, um, how, how does your music connect with younger people now when you perform at these festivals? Does it still connect the boy in the corner stuff, would you say? If I'm honest, I don't think they know it, bro. Like, majority of them. Because, like, obviously they're going to know the newer stuff. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I noticed from, from a lot of these shows. So for all the hype I hear about, ah, oh, you can be playing boy in the corner. Yeah, I've been playing those songs in my set for, well, 13 years. Like, around the world. But 
time goes on, isn't it? If you've got younger people, they're not going to hear I love you and get excited about it the same way that someone my age or a bit younger is, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, but if they feel it, they bounce along to it, but they're just not going to know it like that. Yeah, yeah. But, but because of the resurgence of the album and everything that's been going on recently, they, they want to, yeah, can you, I see the request, ah, can you, can you play, can you play Stop That? Are you going to play Stop That? Make sure you play Stop That. Uh, I'll play Stop That. Uh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> so with the new school generation of grime, do you intend to work with any of them? And is there any names you can tell us that you're working with? Bruv, it, like, if I hear something that's, that's good, then I'll do it. Anyone can say, me, look, I did it with Fecky. Fecky's not a new school grime guy or whatever yeah. you want to call it, but he sent me a track, I liked it, and I jumped on it. But not just because, oh, this is the new guy that they're saying is the new guy today, he's going to bring us back. Like, it did, like <laughs> it's just going to jump on a rhythm. That's yeah. it. All right, I know we can't expect a Boy in the Corner 2, uh, but what can we expect from the new? <laughs> how, how, all right, anyway, how would Boy in the Corners 2 sound? And if, if anyone's got any suggestions, well, I'm here now, isn't it? Like, I what, think a lot of people. I, I think a lot of people might say they want to hear you produce a that's whole what, album. That's, that's what you said to me. That's what you said to me. <laughs> no, backstage. Yeah, no, and, yeah, and yeah, that's yeah, real. Yeah. And I do yeah. feel that. But the, the, the thing is, that could happen too. I just need. I, d I want. I want to hear an album produced by you. No, and that, that's all jiggy. Again. That's that's cool. That is cool, but it's just whatever I feel. Sometimes I make beats. I might sit there and make beats, and I might, I might not feel it. The words just might not just come out. Someone else might give me a beat, and I might just write a whole song there and then. So it's just getting back into that production. Getting to, it was it was a different time. Like I stopped making beats probably after like my third album, and then and then you have to remember why I made beats in the first place. I made beats because I couldn't get beats from nobody else. Who was I gonna get beats from? So that that that's a big part of it, and you just kind of, I, I I was so in love with it. That's that's where that shit came from, innit? But then you just get a bit older, you try different things, and um, you just get used to whatever thousands of people jumping around to bonkers, and then you just like it's, you just the, the hunger just ain't the same. Like I said, I've sat there, I've tried to make beats, but sometimes I don't feel it. So what can we expect from the new album then? Fucking hell. <laughs> Obviously, it's gonna be harder because I I, I recognise that a lot of people are saying they want they want some hard shit. I'm not gonna sound like an angry 17 year old. I can promise you that. But there's gonna be some hard shit because mainly because that's what I'm into as well. It needs to be. I like rap music. I I, I pride myself on knowing a lot about rap. And another part of it is the reason I liked rap music so much from all different. Um, areas and regions around the world and all that because I got, I, I got you got a sense of where they were from and what they were about and that's that's what I would manage to do with a few of my albums but especially Boy in the Corner so I'd, I'd hope to do that again but just without it sounding the same but so just just pure rap but then like I said it, it, it just shit needs to be catchy shit needs to mean something like and, and it's like it's just a different time, so I just, I'm just working on it, working there, trying not to fall to the pressure and that. Because making it, you have to remember, I'm I'm on my sixth album now. It's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's you know what I mean, a lot's happened in that time. Like, like I've been around and seen a lot, but it just and then making stuff that people are interested in hearing as well. Like so people who have gaps. Like I was watching a documentary on Daft Punk. Like they have like four years in between albums and shit like that. You know what I mean? To so just experiment and just try as much different shit as they can. Yeah, we don't want to wait four years though, bro. It's been like four <laughs> years since my last <laughs> Another time. four years though. Right, right. Yeah, no, um, I'm on it. How many records you sold, would you say? In total. I, I honestly don't know, bro. I don't know, man. Enough. The mind boggles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the mind boggles. All right, cool. So I'm going to open it up to the audience now. Um, you've got your opportunity. Just raise your hand. Anyone? If I've missed any questions that need to be asked. Okay, so we'll go to that guy just behind the camera there. Yeah, that's you, bro. Uh, hi, um, my name is Jay. What's happening, bro? Uh, before I even ask my question, I just want to say thank you for the inspiration and influence you've had on our generation. Respect, and, bro. You know, through and through, bro. I'm from East, too, so it's just love. Yeah. I'd love Where are you um, from? I'm Canning Town. Yeah, yeah. You want six, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So yeah, my, my question I was going to ask, I heard you mention a lot about, even just briefly, just now, you mentioned how, you know, it's your sixth album and you've seen a lot, you've been a lot, been a lot of places and even it being, you know, stabbed in Napa or whatever, you, you know, the kidnapping, all of that stuff, I heard you mention a lot of stuff. So like, what would you say, you know, up to this point was the one thing that like, you know, that kind of kept you sane to this point? Because you've done a lot, you've, you've seen a lot, you're, you know, you still inspire us as artists and as, you know, people coming from, you know, probably a similar background. What was the one thing that, you know, you probably stood by till this day and that's kind of shaped you and kind of kept you, you know, I don't know, humble or the person you are today? This shit works, bro. Yeah. Like, I made, I set out to make some music, it, it worked. Fair so man. you just have to just keep going. Fair That's it. Fair. Every day, like every day. But sometimes I question it. You always have times when you're like, "What the fuck is all this about?" And then just like, "Well, let me just get in the studio." That's mm. that's it. And then being able to feed your family. For real. Yeah, man. Thanks, man. Appreciate that. Respect, Thank you, bro. Uh, we got this guy at the front here, please. Hey. Hi, you alright? This guy, though. Watch out for him, though. Obviously. Blakey. Okay. Hi, I'm Sid. Um, I'm right? currently training to be a doctor. And I dedicate uh, my med school off uh, to your first album. All right, thank you, bro. Uh, that really helped me. And um, that's mad. That's mad. Um, so now I'm working for a charity called Street Doctors. So yeah. what we do is we go to the local youth offending centres and we work with kids 11, uh, ages 11 to 17 who are currently involved in a lot of street violence. And what we do is teach them first aid and trying to change their attitudes towards it. That's amazing. Um, so what would your advice be to these type of kids who feel sort of trapped? Because that's the type of, um, that's the vibe I feel from them all the time. You have to find out what you really like, man. And use that same energy that you'd use to show everyone that you're not having it. And you'll bore man up. And you'll lick a man down. Yeah. And <laughs> put it into what you really like, and you'll be like, you'll be amazed how far you can go with it, man. Because if people see you're serious, people want to be around serious people, and then serious things happen, and then sometimes it's serious money and serious situation. You know what I mean? Like, you can go anywhere. Thank you very much, man. Uh, there's a guy there uh, in the shirt, uh, stripy shirt. It's a John man. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right, nice. um, how how do you keep wanting to do music and keep working? Considering the Queen probably knows who you are. I know it's like nice. you open, you did the opening ceremony. It's yeah. like the biggest thing in the world. Like 360 million people must have watched you. It's a billion. How? All right. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do next? What is next? And that's what exactly is. And every time you make an album, you go through the same thing. Like, what do I do next? Oh, have I still got it? Oh, 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 can I still do it? Oh, it's not working. And then you find your flow. And then you just, you just keep going, man. You just, and then you see other people doing their thing. And you're like, oh, shit. I need to do my yeah. thing. Yeah. Sound. Nice one. Yeah, What's driving you with this album, then? What's the main thing? Because you've had different kind of like drives for different albums. What's driving you with this album? What would you say it is? Obviously, the... the the scene's popping, isn't it? I can't act like I can't see it. So I was like, rah. Like, but I haven't got the same stuff to say as everybody else, necessarily, you know what I mean? So just the fact of just being in it, so then even just listening to loads of old school shit, listening to shit from the 90s that I wasn't even into then, and, and stuff I was into, and understanding what they were saying differently, because I'm older, like, oh, rah, shit, is that what he was saying? Like, rah. I, I, I didn't know what he meant when I was 15. You know I mean? So trying to make a classic body of work again, that just the sonically, sound quality-wise is going to make people engage. It's going it's to be engaging, make people respect it, and just not just hype, because I still can't... If I, I can't just put out just hype. If I'm, if I'm going to bother putting out an album, I can't put out nothing with, just, with fillers. I understand that it needs to be a cohesive body of work. So that, that's what drives me. All right. So all this side of the room, what's going on with this side? It's kind of cap there. Well going, big man. Yes, sir. Um, I see you've done loads in America all the way through your career. You've always stayed faithful to um, America. I was surprised when um, Sway was reeling off facts and facts and facts about you. Do you know what I'm saying? So yeah. Do you think that America still should be a big target for upcoming artists now? Yeah, why not, man? Because at the end of the day, you're always going to... It's always been the way, uh, whether it's been with reggae, 
rap, rock or whatever, we've always looked up to over there because that's where a lot of stuff came from in the first place. So you're always going to want to kind of impress them and it's a huge market. Everyone thinks they can make millions and all that as well. But even I know that if, if I'm not talking to the man down the road, then it's not, it's not going to connect here or there. Sometimes it does for certain people. Sometimes in America, the stuff that they get, they understand is stuff that's more of, of an attempt to sound like what they're doing. They get it in their own way and deal with it in their own way. But what, what got me big in the first place was talking to fucking someone in East London or South London or North London, and then it went out to the suburbs, you know what I mean? Thank you, sense? bros. All right, we literally got one more minute left, so, and four hands up. Eeny, meeny. Let's go this side of the room. Yo, Dizzy, you good? That's good, fam. Great, great, great. Um, my question is, over your whole six albums, what has been your most creative period freeing for you that you felt, I've got no strings attached, I can do what I want? Has, or do you feel, is that yet to come? It's probably my first album, Boy in mm -hmm. the Corner, and then my fourth. Because the, the first one, there, there, were, like, there, were, there was no expectations. Yeah. And then the fourth one is where I went independent again. So it's like I went back to square one. Okay. And then it just went mad. So those are the two. Sick. We've got time for one more? Uh, yeah, we've got time for a couple more. What's happened? Uh, okay, we'll go to this guy and then we'll make our way up to you. <laughs> Thank you. Good? Hello. Um, okay. Yeah, um, I just want to ask about um, um, the Asha D. Like, um, uh, that's your dealer battle on uh, Choice FM because yeah. that was a big, a, a big event of uh, of uh, my youth, okay. um, and you obviously you, you used the uh, lyrics in you in 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 the boy in the corner, right, 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 and so it was quite a, a, a meaningful thing. So I was asked like how how big of an event was that for uh, for for uh, you? Not as big as it seems like no. it was for you. <laughs> <laughs> But, but man, there's been there's been loads of things like just from back then that just seem like the crazy Titch thing. It was big like, for me as well. Still watch that shit, you know what I mean? Like, but to me, it's just like, right, you lot are still on that. Like, it's become legendary. But, but that's that's amazing too, isn't it? Like, it is does, it is. does that um, get on your nerves? But if people talk about, you know, the crazy Titch incident. Yeah, because where, it depends how they talk about it. <laughs> It depends on what they think they know. No, but this gentleman just spoke about it. It's a very inspiring, it's an exciting moment, man. You know what I mean? Like yeah, on, you on lot the outside, yeah, I guess. Like, oh, for you, was it was it quiet? It wasn't fun. The, the, uh, let's talk about the Asher it, D. It, 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 it wasn't was fun, fun. innit? Like it was like it weren't a game, not really. Like it's all fun. That's the this whole all these things, these beefs and things. Sometimes they spill over and get serious. It's always a bit of entertainment for everyone, and especially now, even more, ah, everyone's getting involved in the clash and online and things all the time, but it's like, it can get very peak. And then look, there's a lot of, lot of misinformation that goes along, that becomes a legend along with it, especially if you're like myself and you just kind of try and stay in the background and get on with shit. So, it is where it is, man. Yeah. All right. Is there any musical sounds that you regret? Is there any song that you regret? I don't regret shit, bro. Because you know when you know when kind of uh, in terms of working with labels, sometimes artists have to compromise. Have you ever found yourself in that situation where you've you, you know have what, to you compromise? You know what? I must say, yeah. With the situation I'm in now, I'm so surprised, like, and I'm so I'm like I'm humbled and grateful because I thought a ma being with a, la a major label would be the complete opposite of what it's been. Like, it's been so easy. They've been, it's been so calm and accommodating. And I've got, I ain't got a bad word to say. Like, it's, it's been the freedom I've had to just do. It's been great. So as far as comp compromise, if there's been a compromise ever, it hasn't been because of the label thinks I should do this or do that. It's because I want to try this. And what's going to happen if I do that? And sometimes it goes well like you want it to. And sometimes, God, I think I just need to make a new song and keep it moving. Sometimes that happens, but that's supposed to, isn't it? 
What's the most experimental song you said you would say you've made that did what you wanted it to do? Bonkers. Because I, di I didn't really quite know how that was going to go. It was it just, it's like, oh, he sent me it. It's like, oh, this is something I would have hated when I was a kid. But, like, but I understand it now because at the time I was, what, 20 something and I'd been to IB for. Like, but, but, but until I was 18, um, LA was the first place I ever traveled to, and that was to do the Fix Up Look Sharp video. Then Napa was the second place I ever traveled to. But before that, I'd never left England. So I didn't understand what all that fucking house music was all about. <laughs> then, uh, I understood Garage because the Garage like, was a bit, bit, bit harder, a bit jiggier, innit? Like, it was some, it, the Hood was into Garage as well, innit? Yeah, yeah. But house, it was, I felt like it was a bit older. I didn't really have, have no, no connection to it. So when I started going to IB for. That's when I started understanding. So then that's that's when things like Bonkers and Dance With Me and Holiday and all them ones, because I, I started understanding about art. Just this fun and have a good time and positive vibes and energy and that. Before that, it was all just kind of dark. All right, I think the mic's made its way downstairs now. Yeah. What's good, this yes, um, Mr. Darcy from Bot. Um, when Dirty Stamp first opened and you signed D-Double and Footsie, I was like, this could be the equivalent of like Def Jam, but a grime version. What stopped you from being the UK equivalent of Russell Simmons for our scene? I don't know, Russell Simmons weren't a spitter as well. He, like, he weren't an artist. So there's that. Forget the lyric part. <laughs> Forget the lyric part. I'm talking about business, the business acumen, the actual structure, the infrastructure of the label, signing the best artists. Like, what, was it the responsibility of putting the scene under your wing? Like, what prevented you? When you say put the scene under my wing, that's what I mean. This is all like, we're not in school, innit? Like all this, uh, bring me in, bring like all this, this talk of all this imaginary like scene thing and all that. I, I don't know what all that means. As I just see a bag of people I know on D E since I was like fourteen. That, that he, I grew up listening to him, so just being around him and having him about and making music with him, and then it just so happens that I've got a record label. You have to, I had a record label when I was sixteen, bro. I know. Like, I know. So, I was, that's, so it just started off as just put something to put out records. Then it's a situation, but as far as trying to you just do what you can in it, and if it pops, it pops. I don't know what else I could have done. They put out the music they wanted to put out. I did too, and then I don't know. We're still brethren. You know what I mean? They'll be there tomorrow. Thank you. Yes, sir. Dizzy man, thank you. Nice thank you for being man. here today. Thank you for all of the energy, time, and excellence you've put into music, man. You've touched so many people, and you've changed. Not even talking about grime, like UK music. You changed it bro thank you bro you understand so um long may that continue as well thank you man Bye -bye. round of applause for Diddy Master please <laughs>